Susan Barger on behalf of the FAEIC. Go ahead, Susan. Hi. Um, welcome to everyone. I hope that uh, you've had a nice summer. We've been very busy. And um, I'm going to quickly go through these slides. Um, first of all, I want to remind you that the handouts are down below the chat box. You can da uh, download them. If you haven't downloaded the two ASLA technical leaflets uh, before you sign off, you're out of luck because uh, we have permission for people to receive those uh, while we're live. So um, make sure that you sign them before it, you download them before you sign off. Um, the, the keep in touch with us is, is through the uh, CTCC announce list. And that's only for announcements, maybe one, two, sometimes three a month. You can also like us on Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter. Um, if you need help because of a disaster, and I know there are a lot of disasters right now, you can call the 24-hour hotline for the National Heritage Responders, um, and they will help. If you have a question about caring for collections, you can post them in our discussion forum. And probably in the next week, the discussion forum is going to change to a different format. And I will be posting the instructions on how to register for it. Because even if you're registered for the discussion forum now, you won't be for the discussion forum when it, when it migrates. So um, just keep that in mind. You can always contact me at this email address. I'm happy to hear from you. And coming up next month, we're going to have a, uh, a webinar on evaluating collections care information resources. In October, at the beginning of October, we're going to have a webinar on feathers and caring for feathers and legal issues with feathers. Uh, late in the month, we're going to have something on dealing with political ephemera. Um, we have a big schedule for the fall. And we're going to start the Connecting to Collections Care courses. We have two coming up for the fall. I expect to get the first course announcement up by next week. It's going to be on exhibitions and preservation. The second one will be on moving stuff. And that's it for me. I'm going to hand you over to Heather Galloway. Uh, for our talk today. So have fun. And I will be watching for questions. I will catch them for Heather to answer at the end. If we have more questions and there's time to answer, um, Heather has said she'll write answers and I'll post them with the recording. As always, I will post the recording and the handouts except for the two technical uh, leaflets in a few days. And um, as soon as you no longer see the ad for this webinar in our on our home page, that means that the recording's been posted. OK, so thank you. All right, Heather. OK, thank you, Susan. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, FAIC for its support of Connecting to Collections Care and uh, giving me the opportunity to be here with you today. So my name is Heather Galloway. I am a conservator with a conservation studio in Cleveland, Ohio, where I predominantly treat paintings. I teach in the joint graduate program in art history at Case Western Reserve University and the Cleveland Museum of Art, as well as in the conservation training program at the University of Oslo in Norway. I am a peer-reviewed fellow at the American Institute for Conservation. I served eight years on AIC's Education and Training Committee. I was a member of its task force on equity and inclusion, and I am currently a member of the advisory group for Connecting to Collections Care. What you see in the background of my slide is the Great Hall in the Zimmerman Library at the University of New Mexico, which we will get into in just a moment. I first wanted to share a few overarching thoughts, though, that I have been wrestling with as I gathered stories to illustrate this webinar. There will be examples that I share with you today of institutional response to controversy where the outcomes feel decidedly like a curatorial process. Whether you are a conservator like me, 
a registrar, a collections care manager, an archivist, a security officer, a docent, or a volunteer, it is natural to question and doubt whether you can contribute to the discussion surrounding heritage objects with problematic legacies. As instruction, institutions introspectively examine how well they are reaching all members of their community and how inclusive we are in our practices, I would like to argue that at this juncture, it is important to include many voices, both inside and outside of our institutions, and that when all levels of staff, including outside service providers, engage and embrace a shared mission, our chances of being more inclusive will be greater. In addition to participating, I would argue that we also need to adopt a stance of empathetic listening. While the current political climate, which many agree is divisive and disheartening, I see contained within it an energy and engagement on the part of the public with how we memorialize historic events and how we represent our histories within museums, archives, libraries, and historic sites. This engagement has the true potential to be truly exciting, and I think we need to be involved. So at this juncture, I would like to start with our first poll question, just to get an idea of how many of you have involvement with problematic legacy. So the first question, does your organization or client have collection objects with problematic legacies, either through ownership and or symbolism? We'll give you a second to answer the question. I would also uh, like to, once that question is answered, move on to the second question, which is, does your community have any publicly displayed monuments and or art that have problematic legacies? So and since I am asking about your community, I thought I would start this discussion with my community, which while I work in Cleveland, Ohio, I live in Oberlin, Ohio. And Oberlin is a community that both hosts Oberlin College and has a long history of social activism. It was a leader in the abolitionist movement in the United States, and it was uh, active on the Underground Railroad. Uh, the community of Oberlin and its college also produced a great number of Christian missionaries. And what you see up on the screen here is uh, Oberlin's, Oberlin's town monument, the Memorial Arch, which was a monument to white missionaries killed in China uh, at, during the Boxer Rebellion in 1900. So this monument is on Oberlin College's Tappan Square, which creates the center of our town. And uh, Probably in the late uh, or in the 70s, near the end of the Vietnam War, it became controversial as a symbol of uh, imperialism and colonialism. Uh, it has always been used as, um, or had historically been used as a way of bringing in the graduates during ceremony from Oberlin College. They would pass through this arch, but during this time period, time, the students began to walk around the memorial to protest. Uh, the symbolism of the monument. So the college had to wrestle with this monument for years and the students walking around it during the graduation ceremony. Uh, see if I can get this slide to advance. Here we go. Uh, so you'll see two plaques here that are on the memorial. One describing the memorial. Uh, its designer, its dedication in 1902. Uh, and the fact that it's there to memorialize 13 white missionaries who all were Oberlin graduates, and their five children who were killed during the Boxer Rebellion. Uh, the plaque that you see on the right was dedicated in 1994 by the class of 1994 to finally acknowledge the great number of Chinese citizens that were killed during the Boxer Rebellion. Eventually, uh, more recently in our history, the college moved its graduation ceremony so that the students do not have to enter through the memorial, sort of uh, taking the symbolism out of this event. So it no longer plays a role in Oberlin's graduation ceremony. And a lot of the controversy about the monument and discussions about the monument have died down. 
Uh, as a town member, I will say that this monument um, is fairly well beloved as a backdrop for wedding photos. And anybody who's in the town knows that our high school students show up there the night of prom to have their prom photographs taken. So again, just a little bit of my own uh, community background that is our uh, controversial monument. So I would like to move on to the monument that, or, or the site that I have had some personal involvement. Uh, and this is out at the Zimmerloon Library in um, Albuquerque, New Mexico. And you can see I've got it down here. The architect was John Gaw Uh The construction of the building was begun in 1936. It was completed in 1938. It is a WPA project. Uh, so that was government funding that helped build this library. Uh, this is the exterior. And if we go inside, ah, sorry, lost my screen. Here we go. We are once again in the uh, Great Hall of the Zimmerman Library. And you will see a glimpse of some of the murals in the background that um, I was brought out to examine and to discuss with a class, which I will describe in just a moment. Uh, before that, though, I'd like to look a little bit at this sort of rich environment in which the murals find themselves. Uh, included with the murals, the, you can see some tin wall sconces that were part of the construction. There are also chandeliers. Again, tin work that was done in the area locally. There was a lot of very beautiful hand-carved and painted woodworking. Uh, the carvers were all uh, of indigenous people. They were Daniel Mirabel, Faustin Telachi, and Justin Yazi. I do not know who the uh, fabricators of the tin work was, unfortunately. Here again is a detail of the woodworking. And here is one of the murals themselves. The murals uh, were begun in 1939, and they were stalled in the spring of 1940. They're set into niches. Um, and they were actually not paid for by the WPA, but were paid for by the Carnegie Foundation. Uh, I should add here that the library was eventually named after University President James Zimmerman, who was the president during the construction of the library and who had a role in dictating the theme of unity that these murals are. Uh, it's called the unity of the three people. Um, uh, so uh, again, it depicts the three major populations in the area. Uh, and the, so the building itself, also I should add, was listed in the National Register of Historic Places on August 22nd, 2016. So the murals were executed by artist Henry Kenneth Adams. Uh, he also did some teaching at the university. The first mural you see, as it sort of progresses from left to right, is a mural called Native American People. And then the next mural down the line is was considered to be called Hispanic people. Again, this is Henry Kenneth Adams from 1939. The third mural is the Anglo people from 1939. And then the final mural is called the Union of Three Peoples. And it, um, these murals have long been controversial, not just recently, because of the sort of progression from what is considered indigenous populations potentially primitive towards an arc of increasing uh, sophistication. And I'll, let me remind you again, by the time we get to the Anglos, we have, of course, science and medicine, uh, whereas um, our native population is uh, uh, represented by handicrafts, Hispanics by labor, the Anglos by learning and medicine. And of course, the union of the three people was considered the most problematic of the murals because the Anglo figure is faced out. He has eyes. The Hispanic and Native populations are represented in profile. They are considered to be being welcomed in by the Anglo culture, as if we have finally reached the height uh, of our culture. So this particular, this last mural, uh, this is a photograph of it in the 70s when it was vandalized with paint. Uh, this was not the first time that the mural had been controversial, and I believe there was at least one other incident of vandalism involving this, pla this mural. So um, more recently, 
the staff, the library staff, members of the library staff at the University of New Mexico, Zimmerman's Library, have, uh, request, have petitioned the university and have uh, filed a complaint that these murals create a hostile working environment for them. Uh, they have noted that despite all of the historic complaints against the murals, this information was not included in the petition to have this, uh, uh, the site, including the murals, be listed on the National Historic Register. Uh, there are no plaques or signage that uh, make any indication of the con ongoing controversy with the murals and the activism against the murals. And the members of the library staff who uh, put in this proposal or this complaint to the university uh, also uh, indicated that they were inspired by student activist groups, uh, the Kiva Mem Club, which was a club uh, focused on um, indigenous Native American uh, issues and support and learning. Uh, they had petitioned the university to change the seal, which also include problematic imagery of both conquistador and American pioneers, both populations that had oppressed indigenous cultures that were there originally. So inspired by the student activism, the library staff, or members of the library staff, again, registered this complaint with the university. Uh, in response, in partial response to these complaints being registered about the hostile working environment, uh, members of the staff, in particular, Dr. Kimberly Pinder, who is the dean of the College of Fine Arts and a professor of art history, and uh, Professor Alex Lubin, who is a professor of American Studies and uh, is currently provost of faculty development, created a class uh, to discuss the murals called Community Arts Practice, the Zimmerman Library, Three People's Murals. All told, there were 32 invited guests that came out to lecture to a group of students about the history of the mural and the cultures surrounding the area. So uh, I was one of the 32 invited guest lecturers uh, for this class. So there were uh, library staff members who came to kick off the discussions with the students. There were historians, historic preservation advocates, staff members from the Office of Equity and Inclusion, and a variety of press professors from across the campus from the art history department, psychology, political science, native studies, sociology. Uh, Etc. So uh, my job within, or, or my invitation to come out and discuss these murals, uh, uh, was to discuss what it would be like, or if it would be possible, to remove safely remove these murals and or to cover them up in situ, so that the imagery could not be seen. Um, uh, the reason I had been invited to this was that I had, in fact, so here are a few more details of the vandalism uh, just to recoup. So it had been uh, splashed with paint. Uh, I was brought out to examine the murals, look at the condition of the murals. And while I was up there on a the ladder, um, I did still see signs of, here, here you see there, remnants of paint from the uh, vandalism. And this is the um, molding at the floor where I was standing. You could see that it was both uh, green paint and black paint that were used to uh, splash the mural. This was in the 70s. Um, here, and actually my pointer is an appropriate place, you can still see, see remnants, slightly discoloration. Uh, some of the retouching has shifted, but a lot of the damage to the murals ended up being retouched over. It's not clear to me whether it was easy to remove the vandalism. Uh, or if it was decided safest just to retouch over it. But you can see a little bit of it here, all the way down the feet of the Anglo figure. Uh, and again, this is a, an image uh, is taken in UV light to sort of show all of the retouching. Uh, so I came out to examine these murals um, to see, again, whether they could, in theory, actually be removed from the wall. And again, I said uh, that my experience came out of work that I had done with the ICA Art Conservation Center Regional Lab here uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, where I worked for 16 years. The images that I am showing you now were part of the discussion I had with the students, where I demonstrated to them the removal of WPA murals. Uh, I should add that this 
uh, these murals, which were by Elmer Brown. The one that you see in the pictures here is Cleveland Past and Present Industry and Commerce from 1941. It was part of the WPA uh, Valley View Homes Estate. They were installed in the recreation room. And you should note here that the estates were demolished in 2005. And before it was demolished, the ICA went in and removed the murals so that they could be saved. Uh, you will see one of my colleagues from the ICA. I believe this might be uh, conservator uh, Per Canutus, who is now at the Cleveland Museum of Art. It's hard to tell in Tyvek. Uh, the reason the ICA uh, conservators are dressed in Tyvek here and wearing respirators is that WPA murals were adhered to the wall with a lead white adhesive, which means that their removal uh, involves the creation of lead dust, which is a hazard to humans. So uh, murals, when they are removed from the wall, these murals are painted on canvas, have to be sheared off the wall. It is highly labor intensive. It is somewhat obviously risky for the mural. But in this case, the choice was removal or destruction. Uh, these murals are now uh, uh, been remounted and are installed at Cleveland State University and are continue to be on public view. Uh, this is an image of uh, myself and conservator Wendy Partridge uh, getting ready to roll the murals. So once the murals are uh, deinstalled, these are uh, sono tubes for pouring concrete. Murals can be rolled, these ones that are on canvas. They're rolled face out, and they can be stored this way. These uh, lines you see back here are um, incisions that are made into the mural during the process of installation. You will see that just in a moment on the uh, murals in New Mexico. Again, my job was to sort of indicate to the students at the university what was possible. I was not there to advocate within this class for one action or another, but just to discuss what was physically possible and how things needed to be done in order to ensure the safety of both the artworks and the human beings who were uh, deinstalling these murals. So once again, this is the University of New Mexico's uh, murals, the, by the Adams murals. And you will see here, this is one of the slits that was made in the mural during the installation process, these, uh, uh, when the murals were installed, they often had to release air that caught the trapped in the installation. And they would cut along the design elements in order to try to make those slits cut in, blend into the rest of the mural. And this is me inserting a uh, spatula, testing the adhesion of the mural to the wall. And in fact, it, it was possible to break the adhesion of the mural, uh, again, it's not to say that one wants to do this. It's just to determine whether it is, in fact, possible to do so. Uh, and, and in my estimation, it was possible to remove these murals. But once again, I need to remind the audience here that in doing so, uh, the conservators would be involved. You see up here, uh, this is residues of the lead white adhesive. This is under the wood molding. The murals, when they were put in, uh, were pushed in underneath the molding to make it appear that the molding was in front. And in that process, some of the lead white adhesive transferred onto the wood molding, which is where I did uh, tests uh, to, in, to determine whether there was lead present. And there was, in fact, lead present. So um, the students and Dr. Pinder and Dr. Uh, uh, Lubin's class, as an assignment, had to come up with proposals to the university on how to address these murals. There were, as far as I understand, seven student groups. They worked in groups that were uh, groups of students that represented different disciplines on campus. So they were cross-discipline groups. Um, out of the seven groups that made proposals to the university, only one group proposed the removal of the murals. The additional six groups all proposed covering over the murals in situ and uh, introducing new murals that would be placed safely over the, uh, the hidden WPA murals so that at any time or any time, not that it would be easy, but it would be preserving the murals in situ, allow them to come back to view, should that ever be desired. And that would also allow them to uh, more easily navigate the uh, protections that are now in place because this is a registered site.
me. So um, uh, for me, it was uh, during the process of these students uh, coming up with their final proposals, I was contacted by two of the groups. They had to come up with cost proposals, uh, not that I could answer all of their questions. Uh, but they were very curious. They were very respectful of the discussion. And again, I should uh, r remind people that, oh, that six of the groups wanted to preserve these murals in situ. Um, I have since uh, more recently talked to uh, Professor Pinder, uh, who said that the discussion was ongoing. The university has not made a decision. There is a commission or committee designed of uh, library members and um, some of the faculty who participated in the discussion who will also be making a proposal to the university. It is my understanding that there still is um, quite a, a, a push to have these murals uh, physically removed. And uh, I more recently was contacted by an architect hired by the university to sort of talk about what those costs would be, because uh, even if you cover over the if you cover over the murals and sit to you, you do have a cost at hand. But if you actually remove them, you have even larger costs at hand. So they are gathering those numbers in order to be able to have uh, a conversation about what is even possible, because obviously. Uh, institutions do not have endless resources, and uh, the removal is uh, a, a really an incredibly large expense to do so, not to mention a hazard for both the operators, and it is within uh, an active uh, library setting. So, um, uh, moving, so this is, I present this sort of case study as an example of community discussion. Again, there is no final solution yet, but there is an ongoing active discussion. Uh, you can access a lot of the lectures that were given during the class uh, um, online, and the link to that, um, those, those records of the lectures, including my own, is part of the resources. All of the lectures were open to the public at the time that I gave my talk. Uh, there were members from the local press there. There were members of the student press there reporting on what was going on. So I applaud uh, Professor Pinder and uh, Professor Lubin for trying to make the process as inclusive as possible. Uh, I will say that it takes an enormous amount of time commitment for the general public to sort of follow the discussion. But again, those resources are there if you would like to. Um, moving on to a different type of engagement with uh, protest and uh, problematic objects, exhibitions, uh, signage, providing a context and a space for sort of hidden stories. Uh, I'm going to present uh, very small sort of case studies very quickly just to give you an idea of other activities that are uh, ongoing. Um, most of this I have found from the popular press. This um, uh, citation here. Uh, came from Hyperallergic, which is a newsletter that does a lot of reporting on cultural events and included, uh, also did some reporting on the Zimmerman Library and the University Seal. So this uh, is from the Worcester Art Museum in Massachusetts. This is a painting by John Wolfson. Uh, it is a portrait of Anne, Anna Gibbs. It's from 1767. And uh, the Worcester Art Museum undertook a project in which they began to label objects on display with their history and connection to slavery. Uh, right here, I'm going to point to an additional label that's on the wall. This is the standard museum label, giving you an, uh, information about the painting, oil on canvas, the artist's name. But this here is a label which indicates that uh, Anna Gibbs's uh, father owned a plantation in South Carolina that had 68 enslaved persons. So this is one example. Again, this is a bit of a curatorial uh, uh, practice, but it is giving uh, voice and giving presence to untold stories within our museum setting. Uh, this example comes from uh, an ongoing traveling exhibition. Uh, its, initial, its original title was Casanova, The Seduction of Europe. It started at the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth, Texas in 2017. Uh, it was up on view in Texas until December 31st in 2017. It then moved on to the Legion of Honor Museum in San Francisco, California from February to May of 2018. But at this point, uh, if you all recall, 
the Me Too movement was really getting into swing in the late 2017, and the Legion Museum of Honor felt that it needed to address uh, the ongoing discussions of predatory behavior, oftentimes towards women, but obviously other populations that we have seen more recently as accusations are being made against women now in the Me Too movement. Um, so the Legion, with this exhibition up, felt that they needed to provide more context and uh, hosted evening events. One was called Reckoning with the Past, a forum in which they invited, uh, invited a lot of scholars, uh, predominantly female, to sort of discuss uh, 18th century attitudes towards women, um, and uh, the presentation within museums. The portrait that you see here by uh, Nakier was included in the exhibition. Manon Valetti was, in fact, who is depicted in this portrait, was uh, a lover of uh, Casanova. She was 17 when she began her affair with him while he was 32. And Casanova, I'm sorry I sort of glossed over this, but I'm assuming that many of you know that he created a record of his life uh, including his conquests of women. And uh, in our day and age, many of his activities would be considered illegal and uh, predatory. By the time the exhibition uh, ended up in Boston, where it is now, the museum, the MFA in Boston, uh, took steps to change the title of the exhibition. It is now called Casanova's Europe art, pleasure, and power in the 18th century. They felt that this was a more sensitive title at this stage in the exhibition, uh, rather than celebrating sort of the rakish behavior and the seduction of Europe as uh, Casanova was initially presented. In addition to that, um, the uh, MFA went into, its, into storage and brought out additional objects highlighting uh, the activities of female artists during this time period, whereas the focus um, had included a lot of Boucher paintings, a lot of paintings by male artists. Um, and uh, with that, I uh, would like to move on to uh, our next poll question. And I'm thinking, actually, I have sort of glossed over poll question number three. Um, does your organization or client have resources for a forum in which the community could discuss new meanings or untold stories surrounding uh, controversial objects? I'll give you a second to start to um, address that poll question. Client welcome the opportunity to take a leadership role in community discussions surrounding objects that are not part of your collection. Question, poll question number four. And then finally, uh, you can move on to poll question number five. Do you feel that your organization or client has objects in storage, again, much like the MFA, that could help to tell new stories, provide greater context for these hidden stories that we would like to start to highlight? My final example of providing uh, additional context before we move on to some more dramatic steps comes from the Whitney Museum of American Art. This is an exhibition of artist David Buena Robit. Uh, the exhibition is called History Keeps Me Up at Night. And here you see a protest that was carried out by the AIDS uh, Coalition to Unleash Power, or ACT UP, as it is more uh, commonly known. This protest was carried out on July 27, 2018. And I think most of you probably um, can relate to the fact that obviously when you start to have protests in the galleries, there is concern for objects on display. Uh, this is not, again, a new thing. In 1914, uh, Mary Richardson, a suffragette, went into the National Gallery of London and splashed seven times 
uh, the Rock v. Venus by Diego Velasquez to protest the um, uh, arrest of Emmeline Pankhurst, another uh, suffragette, another English suffragette. So again, protest has been happening in our galleries uh, more and more, uh, but again, it is ha does have historic precedent. Um, in this instance, David Wojnarowicz was an artist that came of age in the 1980s or came of prominence in the 1980s. He was a gay man. He was very active in um, protesting uh, government in action in the AIDS uh, crisis. He was a member of ACT UP. And currently in 2017 or 2018, ACT UP was concerned that the Whitney's presentation of David Wojnarowicz's activities made it seem as if the AIDS epidemic was a thing of history and not an ongoing and important epidemic. And so they showed up this night and made the protest. In return, uh, the Whitney Museum responded with public statements supporting ACT UP. Staff members greeted the uh, protesters uh, at the museum. They listened to what the protesters had to say. They welcomed the protest. And uh, in return, the protesters were invited back on August 4th, 2018, to once again provide further information to the public while they were in the exhibition. Uh, and here are these signs that they are holding up. They designed these to uh, uh, mimic the labeling that the Whitney Museum uh, used as wall text for David Rodinovich's work. And these uh, placards brought attention to contemporary events that drew parallels to the work and the issues that David Wojnarowicz was um, drawing attention to in his own lifetime. So and now uh, I would like to turn to uh, the issue of removal of monuments and other artworks uh, in the, when they have become controversial. And I just, again, to sort of set the stage on the local level, I wanted to move to my uh, return to my hometown of Oberlin and look at some more sort of uh, mu uh, commonplace removals, as removal does happen for monuments. This is the Soldiers' Monument from uh, Oberlin, Ohio. It was erected in 1870, uh, and it was finally dismantled in the late 1930s due to poor condition. So again, this is one reason that monuments do become dismantled. Uh, and here is the monument here in the foreground here. And I will show you in just a second, right here. This is the monument as it stands now. As you can see, it has been entirely dismantled. The historic plaques have been incorporated into a new monument. This monument went up uh, in the 40s and um, it has been added to. This here is the latest addition to the monument to uh, note uh, uh, Oberlin residents' uh, participation in the Afghanistan war. So it went from a monument that memorialized actually Civil War soldiers to represent um, soldiers from the community of Oberlin, Ohio. Again, this is removal of monuments. Uh, this is another monument. This is a monument to Charles Martin Hall. This is in Oberlin again. It was installed in the center of Tappan Square in the pavement. And there became an increased concern that the actions of snow plows and snow removal was wearing down the monument. And um, it has been uh, resituated, raised up on a block, and reinstalled uh, at another corner of the square. So uh, aesthetically, I have to say, personally, I don't think either of Oberlin's uh, reconfigured monuments are as visually successful. Uh, but it does indicate the types of reasons that monuments can be removed and the fact that monuments are removed historically. Uh, I would like to then start to turn our attention towards the community of St. Louis. Uh, where we will be looking at the removal of one of uh, their Confederate monuments. Before I do that, I'd like to uh, draw attention to this monument, or actually this uh, park, which is uh, the Lion Park in St. Louis. And um, elementary school teacher um, Stephanie Teachout Allen, who I will introduce into our discussion in just a moment, brought this monument and this park to my attention um, and told me about a memorial to Union General Nathan Lyon that was erected originally on the campus of St. Louis University. When St. Louis University had a donor who was a Confederate sympathizer, uh, 
that donor indicated that they would not give money to the university unless the monument was removed to this union, union general to another location. And the university did, in fact, comply with this request. And the monument got moved to Lyons Park. Uh, unfortunately, the monument I am showing is not the monument that was moved to the park, but another monument in the park already to uh, Nathaniel Lyon. I only discovered that this morning. Um, it was moved in 1960. Um, there are very few pictures that I can find of the monument that I believe was moved from the campus of the university, but that just may require a little bit more research on my behalf. Um, and I should also say that the monument to Lyon have also recently been suggested in the, in the wake of their Confederate monument being removed that these monuments should also be removed to um, General Lyon because Lyon was responsible for the Bloody Island Massacre of Native Americans in California. Uh, I do not know if the community has taken up that request yet, uh, but I will now turn our attention to St. Louis's Confederate monument that was removed uh, in uh, 2017, I believe. So this is the Confederate monument in uh, Forest Park, St. Louis. The artist who created it was uh, George Dolnay. Uh, he had won a commission in order to produce this monument. He was an artist originally from Hungary, but he actually was practicing in the area and was a professor uh, at one of the universities there in St. Louis. The monument's bronze and limestone. It is 23 feet tall. So this is a rather large monument. And it was donated by the Ladies Confederate Monument Association, as is, are many of our Confederate monuments. Uh, it was erected, as I said, originally. I want to return to this information, though, in 1914. So uh, quite a bit after the Civil War. And amongst the resources that I have included, there is plenty of information out there. I'm not going to spend a lot of time reviewing it. Uh, the uh, Southern Property Law Center does a very good job at sort of setting the stage for um, both the rise of the KKK and uh, a rebirth of uh, monuments towards the Confederacy that were not contemporaneous with the end of the Civil War, but with a reaction uh, to uh, goals of the, the white leadership to sort of suppress um, our black citizens within the community. So these monuments, and this has been discussed a lot, are uh, considered uh, uh, by some uh, monuments towards the Confederacy, but also monuments that pro propagate white supremacy. So um, just giving a, a little more background to the climate at this time in, uh, in Missouri and in St. Louis, I wanted to remind you all that um, on August 9, 2014, uh, a white police officer shot and killed Michael Brown, an 18-year-old African-American teen, and that set off riots in Ferguson, Missouri, which is just outside the St. Louis metropolitan area. On June 17, 2015, uh, the nation saw a mass shooting that killed nine African-American parishioners by a white supremacist, white supremacist in Charlotte, Charleston, South Carolina, which set off a lot of public debate on the national stage about the display of Confederate symbols. So then in uh, April of 2017, when St. Louis's newly, newly elected mayor, uh, Lida Crusen, entered into office, she vowed to review the Confederate monument that was located in Forest Park in the first 100 days of her administration. Uh, uh, in August of the same year, of course, we had the Unite, Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, which uh, at its outset was about the potential removal of a Confederate monument there. Um, so at this stage, I would like to introduce uh, fifth grade teacher, Stephanie Teachout Allen, who works at New City School and is the director of diversity uh, there in addition to being a fifth grade teacher. Uh, Stephanie uh, Allen and I spoke over this past weekend about her work trying to teach her students about the Confederate monuments. And this Confederate monument was within walking distance of their school classroom. 
Uh, Stephanie's school, the New City School, is made up of 44% students of color, with 40% of the students there on some sort of financial aid. Stephanie teaches a two-week unit called Choices Make History. And uh, one of the things that I really, uh, really appreciated about Stephanie's discussion of these murals, and you can hear her and uh, Professor, um, uh, oh my gosh, the name is escaping me. It'll come to me in just a moment. Uh, professor from St. Louis who did some work with her on this and was a parent at the school. Uh, one of the things that I really liked that she said was that she wanted to encourage her students to listen, to understand, and not just to respond. Uh, so she sends her students home to interview the adults in their lives, again, encouraging her students to listen, to understand, and not just to respond with their, their preconceived ideas, to listen to the adults in their lives. Uh, and she had them interview them about um, uh, Confederate symbols, uh, looking at the flag, uh, the Confederate flag, and what it meant to those students. And then the students came back and discussed it amongst themselves, amongst the other students, and came to the re realization that a lot of these symbols meant different things to different people. She took her students to the monument. This was obviously before it was removed. She allowed them to touch it. They discussed the mural. Uh, excuse me, the uh, monument on site, and noted that nowhere on the monument was there a discussion of slavery. This monument had imagery of Confederate families sending their children off to serve in the war. So, uh, and the text on the back of, which you can barely see down here with the students here, this text here, uh, that text says, erected in the memory of the soldiers and sailors of the Confederate States by the daughters of the Confederacy of St. Louis. Uh, much like the students in the um, university setting in New Mexico, uh, and here, I'm sorry, this is Professor David Cunningham, whose name had escaped me. He, this is him meeting with the students from the fifth grade class. Uh, David Cunningham has written a lot about uh, the Ku Klux Klan, and he was met with the students to talk to them about symbolism and monuments in the area. Um, uh, the students from the fifth grade class had the opportunity to make proposals to the mayor, and here you see the mayor, uh, Lita Krusen, with the students from the New City School. Uh, and here you can see this is a uh, new city on the air. There is a link to the interview that was done with um, both David Cunningham and Stephanie Teachout uh, on National Public Radio. And I highly recommend listening to that interview. It's really quite amazing and quite impressive what fifth grade students can come up with, uh, just so that you can all be somewhat informed by fifth grade students. One of the proposals that they made to the mayor that the, the mural, the, excuse me, the monument be encased in Lego and that Sharpie markers be made available so that people could record their hopes and dreams on the Legos. Uh, Stephanie told me they even created a budget, I think, of three Sharpie markers, which they considered enough to give the public a chance to give their feedback to the mural. Uh, Stephanie was also very uh, quick to point out that none of the students actually proposed the removal of the monument, um, that they wanted to see this monument contextualized and uh, um, uh, with uh, uh, and, and altered, but not to be necessarily removed. Uh, in the long run, that did not happen. And you see here, I'm going to move through these quickly so that we can get to some questions. Uh, the debate continued about these monuments on the community level. Uh, and this is May 23rd. There was uh, a confrontation. Um, Stephanie says that the photographs in this make it look a lot more dramatic than it was. Uh, and the mural, excuse me, the, the monument was vandalized overnight. Uh, these are city crews removing that vandalism the next day. Uh, and once again, a few days later, uh, the monument was once again vandalized. Um, at this point, um, this uh, vandalism was not removed, and uh, the mayor of St. Louis finally came to an agreement uh, to have the mural, excuse me, have the uh, monument removed from the site. 
there was a, an agreement made with the Missouri Civil War Museum, who is a, uh, paid for the removal of the monument and has agreed to, to reinstall the monument, but not within St. Louis or even within the county of St. Louis. Uh, and they, again, once again, they paid for the removal of that monument. Uh, and uh, here you see that monument in the process of being removed. Uh, it has not been reinstalled yet at this point, uh, but it is a site uh, in, in which the monument was removed. Um, so uh, once again, I, I want to sort of highlight the fact that in the incidents that I have both discussed with Stephanie on the elementary level and my experience out at the University of New Mexico, where the community has had um, the opportunity to participate in discussion actively, whether they are children, where they are adults, students, uh, there often can be a great deal of sensitivity brought towards these monuments. Uh, but we all know that um, uh, in light of recent activities where students at UNC Chapel Hill in North Carolina uh, recently toppled a monument called, referred to as Silent Sam from a monument of Confederate soldiers, recently, just two nights ago, I believe, uh, toppled a monument that without that forum for public discussion, I would like to suggest uh, that sometimes the results uh, have a huge impact on the artifacts that we spend so much time uh, and involvement in trying to protect. Um, so I would like to leave you with those uh, examples of case studies. I know many of you may have um, other ideas, and I welcome you the uh, chance. Uh, here are my acknowledgments of all the people that have helped me in putting this together. Uh, but as I said, I would like to, at this point, start to open this up to questions. And I would like to post um, my contact information here, because I would like to encourage you to uh, contact me and let me know what your communities have been up to, what they have been involved with, solutions that you have come to uh, in broadening a dialogue uh, in order to um, essentially create a safe environment, as we've seen vandalism, uh, toppling monuments. Uh, these. Uh, obviously have a great deal of impact on the, on the care of these objects and are something that we would uh, like to avoid. So Susan, can we get some questions at this point? Yeah, I, we haven't had very many questions, but um, okay. uh, Stephanie Washburn said when the statue came down, this is the one in Forest Park, um, yes. where did it go? Was it destroyed or put somewhere else? if somewhere elsewhere? So it has not been reinstalled yet. Yes, it was taken away and it's been put into storage. It is under the care of the uh, Missouri, uh, the Missouri Civil War Museum. They have accepted responsibility for the monument. And as I indicated, they paid for the removal of the monument. So they are uh, presumably, they have not publicized where they are storing the monument. They do not, it came apart in multiple pieces, uh, and they do not want to advertise where the, those pieces are being stored for fear that it could draw further interaction, uh, unfavorable interaction with the public, but they do intend to reinstall the monument. Uh, typically, the proposals for reinstalling these monuments have been within a museum, a controlled museum setting, uh, 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 graveyards, uh, sites that are already known uh, for their involvement within the Civil War. Uh, even the students in, uh, in uh, New City School felt there was a big difference between walking to a park where the intention was to perhaps enjoy nature, be outside with your family, uh, where you're not necessarily in the mode of learning at that point. Uh, whether that is a good environment in which you can provide the kind of educational material that you need to provide in order to contextualize these moments. Uh, again, I think that is a, a point that is worth discussing. Controlling the environment in which we provide our audience greater context. Uh, oftentimes I find all the other, uh, the smaller examples, the interior examples, labeling, uh, holding events, these are all controlled. Uh, interior environments where the audience enters with an intention to learn. 
Yeah, I, Lori uh, Sanderlin says some of our cemeteries are concerned that they'll become the land of removed uh, monuments. Um, yeah, uh, yes. she says Wilmington, North Carolina has at least three. Yes, and, uh, yeah, and in fact, I believe the uh, the elementary school students uh, at New City had also suggested, um, can't remember what community, they may have suggested giving their monuments to, um, was it Richmond, Virginia? And uh, Stephanie had to question the students about whether other communities really wanted to accept these monuments as well. Yeah, we do potentially have um, uh, a problem on our hands of the number of monuments, although I think one could make an argument that uh, the sheer volume and numbers, depending on the numbers that are removed, does give voice and physical presence to the activity that went on sort of, you know, post failed reconstruction during the civil rights uh, movement uh, about uh, the number of these monuments that were erected. Um, yeah, these are all good questions. Okay. Uh, they are challenges. Yeah. Um, Michael Galvin had mentioned that um, in his town they removed a monument, and then Jimena Valdivia asked uh, what happened to it, and he said that the monument, it was a monument com uh, commemorating the removal of Native peoples from his, his area, and they removed it and took possession of the main bronze element in his collection. I don't know where Victor is. Maybe you can tell us, Michael. Um, and then Pamela Brown from Arcata, California says, what do you find would be effective responses to people who say you're erasing history? Mm. Yeah, that comes up a lot, and it is discussed far more eloquently uh, by many other people than myself. Uh, uh, the obvious from the point of view of somebody like uh, my husband who is a historian is that we do have lots of primary sources, books, literature, uh, writings of the time that do help us establish our history. Uh, the sense that a monument is the most uh, effective way of preserving history I think could also uh, be debated. Uh, I at one time thought about starting with um, a quote from the uh, writer and novelist Robert Mussel, who in a 1927 essay wrote something uh, about monuments, saying that there is nothing in the world as invisible as monuments. They are somehow impregnated against attention. It runs down them like water on oil cloth. One, ex one experiences them as a tree, as part of the scenery, and would stop in momentary confusion should they be missing one morning. But one never looks at them and usually does not have the slightest idea whom they represent. Uh, you know, one could argue uh, that that is a far cry from the truth. Uh, but monuments do start to sort of lose some of their potency. Again, Oberlin uh, High School students taking their prom photographs uh, in front of this monument to the, to the 13 white uh, missionaries who died from Oberlin in a, in a rebellion that killed thousands of Chinese. Um, uh, so I say that um, I don't think that we are erasing history when monuments are removed. Uh, we are creating new stories. And we should be aware of those new stories that are being removed. Uh, not that I am advocating for violence. Obviously, when monuments are pulled down, there is that imagery of those monuments being toppled. That does create new histories, does create new stories. Um, are they valid stories? Do we want to memorialize them? Uh, some of the professors uh, down in St. Louis uh, do have a website. Uh, where they talk about some of the imagery. And one of the suggestions that I saw on that website was that the Confederate monument in Forest Park should have been left in place with the vandalism uh, in order to document both sides of the story. Again, I'm not sure what it would be like to live in your own community with a vandalized monument. I, I could see a lot of discomfort with that. 
Um, and I'm not necessarily advocating that. In fact, I feel a pretty strong discomfort with that. I'm not sure that's where I personally feel comfortable. Uh, but these are arguments that are being made. Uh, I did see one scholar who suggested that one of the things we do erase is the impetus to have the discussion when the monuments are removed. Uh, again, that yeah. is a very um, valid point. Very valid point. And I think these things will be decided community by community. In, in Santa Fe, we live with a vandalized monument on the plaza uh, because we have a obelisk in the middle of the plaza that had at one time had a thing that said something about savages. And there was a controversy about it. And one morning, people came, and savages had been chiseled out. So that's, that's the way it was left. OK. Um, Molly Cannon says, is there a role for recontextualizing monuments or murals? Have there been examples where added interpretation has helped bridge communities? Uh, that's a good question. Um, the, the murals that are at the University of New Mexico, initially when the library staff started to write up their objections to the murals, they, um, and you can see this, uh, two of the members who were involved, two of the library staff members who were involved in writing that um, uh, formal complaint to the university, uh, they were kicked off the lecture series at the University of New Mexico. And they discussed the fact that they initially had wanted to petition the university to include labeling or some placard, again, to discuss the co ongoing controversy with the mural, murals. Uh, eventually, they decided that's not what they, they wanted. They wanted more. They wanted those murals gone. Um, uh, again, I think it is if you go back to the image of that great room, it is in a library setting. Um, I would there is a label that discusses the murals, and I, you know, I'm not sure how many people look at that mural, uh, that label. Uh, again, it's not discussing the controversy, and um, I'm not sure how much uh, the labeling of those things can help or not. Uh, but those are the examples that I used in a museum, trying to provide the information to the willing audience who, who wants that information. Uh, I think it certainly could be a very good first step. Uh, I think it is harder to do in an outside environment. Yes. Um, I know so many people that studied in Zeremen and never noticed the murals because um, they were busy studying. Um, so Simon Lambert uh, says, are you aware of cur any curatorial solutions that were developed in collaboration with interest groups, not by an internal curatorial team? Um, there is amongst the resources. There was uh, an exhibition um, that happened in uh, Birmingham, England where they brought in community members um, from underrepresented minority groups to sort of curate an exhibition. Um, and there are at least uh, some responses to that sort of activity, talking about the, ex I don't recall right now the, the name of the exhibition, but it is in the resources. Uh, and some of those curators, outside curators who were brought in, discussed that experience and whether it is possible in the language that they were using to uh, decolonize the museum to sort of take out the sort of uh, the the white man's acquisition of other cultural properties and putting them on display within the museum setting. Uh, and they do question about whether that can be done in a museum setting. So I recommend that you uh, take a look at some of that discussion. Um, I hope that in yeah. uh, okay. and part. I mean, I do think there are there are curators. Uh, the Museum of uh, American Indian and the Smithsonian has done a lot of work with Native communities to contextualize their objects, to bring knowledge to it, to bring the knowledge that they have of their objects. Uh, there have also been discussions about that knowledge moving the other way from the museum setting and being repatronized uh, to uh, not re repatronized. 
repatriated to indigenous cultures. So uh, there are a lot of fruitful exchanges in those environments uh, that can be found if you start to do the, the to do the looking. Yeah, and I. Briscoe uh, says it. Oh, go ahead. Uh, there was also, uh, okay. I believe, it's in Minneapolis. There was a uh, a very large outdoor sculpture that was erected. I, I'm not going to recall the contemporary artist's name. It was meant to memorialize um, sort of government executions, uh, including a group of Native Americans who had been hung. And um, the indigenous population in the area were outraged by the monument and felt uh, oppressed by its presence. And that was a very interesting story. The artist gave the monument, the, the ownership, uh, the copyright to that monument to the indigenous people in the area, and they ceremonially uh, buried the monument. It was dismantled. It was the um, uh, from the Walker Art Center up in Minneapolis. A very interesting story. So yes, uh, people have brought in. That was actually after the fact, but it was the controversy that arrived before this very large sculpture went up. Uh, and so it's a very interesting story to look at. Um, yeah, uh, Sarah Hanke says this is a reference to the work scaffold at the Walker. Yes, um, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so Grant Briscoe says, is there an effective way to protect objects or monuments and still discuss how to address them? In other words, won't talking about these, uh, talking about how to address supposedly controversial pieces invite protests and vandalism that can damage adjacent, adjacent pieces? So I guess I would never buy into sort of the slippery slope argument to ignore something, to ignore a discussion because you're afraid of having it, I don't think is a I don't think it's a valid reason. Uh, I think it's better to get out in front of things, I would say. Um, yeah, I guess I'm not sure that uh, I, I would agree. I, I understand the fear. There is definitely, and, and that, I think that is a big factor for us. And I realized that when I showed up at the University of New Mexico, I probably should have had more fear stepping into that situation than I did, uh, because I felt I was there to sort of discuss neutrally what was possible rather than to advocate. And it wasn't long before I became aware that my presence could be taken as, um, as an advocate for these murals removal. If I suggested how you could remove then I was therefore suggesting that they be removed. Um, I will state for a fact that I don't want to put a Tyvek suit on and a respirator and deal with lead white for a very long time now. I hope never have to do it again. Uh, but um, I realized once I was out in New Mexico that there potentially should be some anxiety on my part in having that discussion. Uh, but I don't acknowledging that fear and making your audience uh, comfortable. I think is an important thing, uh, and, and I still welcome the opportunity to have these discussions with people, knowing that I certainly do not have all of the answers. Yeah, um, Phil Ford from uh, Enrico, uh, Virginia says, it seems like the idea of what could be done reasonably would be storage of these, or for us here in uh, RVA, which I guess must be regional Virginia, um, to maybe put up, uh, put them in a museum setting with the proper context. But it's so expensive. Uh, but it seems like if this is a reasonable solution, why can't money be put to solve this? That is a very good question. And that really is the burden of this, uh, because people are going to get caught up and the symbolism, uh, the emotions of the time, the events that are going on. But of course, as collections care people, we are the ones that need to find the way and the place and the funds to store these things. So that is a big burden. Uh, and um, yeah. 
that really does need to be examined Lynn, closely. Yeah, Lynn Sanderlin says, Phil, I understand what you're saying, um, but the museums can only fit so many. During the huge push for Confederate monuments around the turn of the century, um, make it nearly impossible. Civil War battlefields, um, they could, but how many? I guess right. how many can take these monuments? Yes, and a reminder again that one monument in St. Louis was, I believe, was 23 feet t I mean, these things are big. Some of them just cannot yeah. be moved yeah. indoors to an indoor setting. Uh, and I, I could just imagine a field where these monuments are mothballed. Um, uh, maybe the Confederate daughters will step in to assist us. I don't know. I doubt that. So yeah. sorry for my, my poor sense of humor. Um, but yeah, um, this is Michael Re big issue. Yeah, Phil says that would be the hope um, that the, the UDC would jump in. Michael Redman from Las Vegas, New Mexico uh, says, my museum has considered an, an exhibit on a controversial group from the 19th century, a group of night writers that targeted a group that locally was a minority but national in the majority. Depending on the audience, uh, they were considered freedom fighters, terrorists, and or cattle thieves, and a criminal gang. Local gossips uh, claim that the group still exists. If we proceed with the, an exhibit, would it be better to tell the group's uh, story, or should we focus on modern opinions and views on the group? cannot both be done. I mean, I guess that is, it, when, I guess I'm not sure that I entirely understand the question. Is the, is the implication that their stories are not an accurate story of the group, or is only part of the story? Because a lot of the argument is about broadening the number of stories that are, are told so that we have a larger picture, a more complete and accurate picture of a group, a time period, a moment, and history. I'm not again. I'm not sure I'm doing this question justice. Yeah, I, I think it's a tough question. Um, and, and certainly, you know, when people would put up controversial exhibits, sometimes they get a lot of um, of pushback. Uh, but sometimes it helps break open a discussion, like the Inoue Gay controversy. Um, and that really helped, I think, bring a lot of stuff out about why we were bombing people. Um, I think one of the tactics that has also worked sort of curatorial, curatorially is to give those vested audiences a preview of what you intend to do or what you hope to do, because you may be surprised by their reaction to that. Um, again, the Whitney Museum with ACT UP, David Wojnarowicz was a member of ACT UP. And in fact, uh, the Whitney had done programming, already had programming about AIDS activism incorporated into the exhibition. But remarkably enough, for whatever reason, they hadn't reached out to act up specifically. So there was information about AIDS activism, but it wasn't from ACT UP. So the Whitney obviously quickly adjusted. They invited ACT UP back in. Um, I think there was um, good feelings between the, uh, the groups, but it, it's, it's very clear that people do like to be asked before they are presented with the information and before your final decisions have been made. Yeah. Um, I just want to say there's, there's been a big discussion in the chat box about the Minneapolis exhibit. And I will include these things in, in a, a second handout. And so don't worry. Michael Remen says, uh, in reference to this group in Las Vegas, the larger picture is hard to find as the, as the sources do not agree on their story. Just another New Mexico story. Um, okay. 
Um, and I live in New Mexico. I, I, I understand that our history can be kind of weird. Um, let's see. Uh, Eileen Wang says, what was the counter argument of the protesters with the Confederate flags at the St. Louis Monument? Um, there, if you go online, you can find some actually recorded interchanges between various people. Um, and my general understanding is it's, uh, again, removing heritage objects, erasure. Uh, I think they're fairly standard arguments to the removal of Confederate monuments. And, and these were no different. Yeah. Um, Jennifer Gundry says, um, how did the university decide which panels, panelists to invite, if you know it? Um, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the process was. Um, I mean, just looking over the list of people who came in, I think some of it makes uh, clear sense. The historic preservation, uh, people were invited in. Uh, people were familiar with the process of, uh, of, of a monument becoming uh, listed on the registry. People from the library invited in. Um, I think it was fairly organic. I think they discussed this a lot. I mean, I first uh, uh, ran across Kim Pinder. She and I were college uh, classmates uh, sometime in 2017. and. She started to basically interview me and discuss with me about what my experience was as a conservator once she found out that I had actually been involved in the deinstallation of a WPA mural. She then in January sent me an email and invited me. Um, again, I think they were looking for resources and people who they felt could just give the students a full sense of all of the moving parts. So that meant bringing people in from um, the Native community, from the Hispanic community. They brought in uh, former activists, students who had graduated already but had protested those murals in the past. They invited them back onto campus to have a forum to discuss their early activism against the murals. Again, it was all to create this, the setting and the stage for uh, what could be done. Some of us were there for giving pragmatic information and others were to give historical context. Um, the psychology of you know, living in these environments with um, oppressive imagery, uh, all of that was discussed. Social justice was discussed as well. So uh, again, there were two professors yeah. who were involved in setting up the class. So um, they tried to be uh, multidisciplinary. And in the resources, there's also a, a long interview with um, some of the pre presenters and the people at the library. So I, I really encourage listening to those and listening to some of the talks. They're, they are quite intensive. Um, let's get back to the questions. Um, how do you recommend for, the, for conservation professionals how, how do you recommend that conservation professionals engage in these conversations? That's from Alicia Boswell, uh, Boswell in, in Santa Barbara. Um, I think that we have to approach it like we would do anything, that we give the information that we have at hand. Um, you know, there is some advocacy involved, I will say that I do hope that the university does not remove the murals. Um, I hope that they cover them over in situ. I, I emotionally, as a person, I understand why the murals, it has been advocated for the murals to be covered. So emotionally and personally, I actually sort of agree with that proposal. Professionally, I would like to see those murals stay behind, but keep in mind, part of me just doesn't want to see anybody up there in a Tyvek suit and a respirator having to tear those murals off the wall, which is such a hard job. Uh, but I think we need to provide people with the appropriate information so that they can make 
their decisions. I was never going to go to the University of New Mexico and say, it would be wrong if you cannot remove these murals from the wall. That's not my job to say that. I know for a fact that those murals could be removed from the wall. Will they, will, would it be an entirely safe process? No. Anytime you're, you have that type of invasive process, there's always risk to the object. We have undertaken that kind of risky deinstallation when a, when a building was about to be destroyed. We could justify it then. It's, it's, it obviously gets harder, but if somebody is to take those murals off the wall, I do hope that, that the university employs appropriate professionals in order that it is done safely. Again, that's not what I would advocate. I think it just makes more sense to cover them over in situ, both for the safety of the people, the murals, and to give the opportunity for the community to introduce new artistic endeavors in those spaces and to explore new histories, knowing that the other murals are still there. Yeah. So I, again, um, I think it is our job to provide information as, as requested. So. Yeah. Um, Michael Galvin said, to decolonize a museum is a strange concept, knowing mm -hmm. that the very foundation of museums as an entity is is a colonial concept. In Native American context, um, we're really looking to uh, indigenize or reinvent the museum to reflect our worldviews and cultural concepts. Um, and I'm, I'm going to say right now, there's been a, a big discussion about several topics. I will collect them from the chat box, and I'll post them. So yeah. go ahead with that one. That is a really uh, a very important sentiment and, and, and one that I think is really relevant. And again, some of the resources, again, at this exhibition in Birmingham suggested that it can't be done, that you cannot decolonize the museum because it is inherently a colonial structure. Uh, but taking that then and then deciding what can we learn from that structure? What can we do to improve that structure? And again, there's been a lot of work done in, uh, with Native communities here in the US, I believe in Australia and potentially New Zealand. There are lots of models out there. Um, again, I'm, I apologize, I have been very American-centric here. Uh, I know that there's a lot of very important work that has been done along those lines. Um, and it's, I think those things present opportunity, right? Opportunity rather than just this burden that we can't be what we've been all along. We should view this as an opportunity. Um, and Sue Taylor from Alamogordo, New Mexico says, it is the job of museums to educate when faced with a controversial issue rather than moving to have it removed, um, use the object as a springboard to discuss changing points of view and public perception. Interpreting si interpretive signage, as mentioned above, showing all points of modern views regarding artifacts as opposed to what point of view uh, would have been a century or more ago. People today are too quick to superimpose their modern views onto the past, which was different. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, there are, I see some valuable things in that statement, although we do live in the present. And one of the things that the present is teaching us is, again, to bring in other voices. So we already know that oftentimes what is represented in our museums and our settings is not the full story. So. Uh, bringing modern attitudes towards telling more than one story, I think is, I don't really have a problem with that. I also think that it's interesting to see how other populations react to what we take, and we, I mean, for a lot of us who are white museum professionals, as, as being in the total sum good. Uh, there was recently a, uh, a video essay by two 
uh, journalists. From, one was from the New York Times. I do not recall where the other was from. Both African American journalists who uh, recorded a journey through uh, seeing various southern monuments. And there was a slave auction block, and I'm sure one of our audience members knows the answer to this. I do not remember the town that it was in. Uh, but they filmed sort of the street corner in which that slave auction block was in. Obviously, a very uh, um, it's right in the center of town. And they went into the black community and talked to them about what it was like to have that auction block in the center of town. And the black community wanted it gone, at least the population that they spoke to. And even though it is a historic object, they didn't want it in the center of the town. They didn't want to be reminded on a daily basis, casually, as people walk by, not paying attention to it, that that legacy was there. Um, whereas the mayor of the town was arguing that this needed to be, and I think it was the mayor, I could be wrong on that, was arguing that it, it needs to be preserved. And potentially the answer to that is both and. Yes, it needs to be preserved. It is an important artifact. We cannot forget that part of our history. But to have it in the center of town, perhaps you need to listen to the African-American community there who says they don't want it. Yeah. You know, how do, we, um, who, how do we respond to those audiences who do not agree with us? OK, so we have a few more minutes. I want to remind people, please um, fill out the evaluation. Um, and I will collect all these conversations. Uh, and I'll put them on a, a separate thing. I also want to remind you that these two technical um, leaflets from ASLH, if you want them, please um, download them before you sign out, because they won't be available otherwise, um, unless you go to ASLH and buy them. Um, and one of the things that Rebecca Orlando Hernandez says is that the murals are only part of the, the discussion in Zimmerman. The building design itself, which is beautiful, is inherently native by design. Where do you draw the line? And uh, Eileen Wang says, uh, I agree with Heather's view about how to deal with the murals in the, in the New Mexico Library. When dealing with controversial works of art, or monuments, it's useful to remember what uh, context provides. Um, yeah, so it, I think that's it. The resources for dealing with, oh, I, Sarah True says, the resources for dealing with audiences who don't agree with you. Yes, there are some there <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, in, in the handout. <laughs> And so it's time for us to go. Thank you very much, Heather. Thank you, everyone who participated. Remember, download this SLH technical leaflets. We'll see you next month.